Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillah. Ve salatu ve selamu ala seyyidina Resulillah. Ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve men gala. Ve rabbi şahli sadri. Ve yassir li amri. Ve ahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli amma ba'd. Selamu aleykum ve rahmetullahi ta'ala ve barakatuhu. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we are back in our study of Al-Arba'oon Al-Nawawiyyah, the 40 Hadith collection of Al-Imam Al-Nawawi. Uh, last week's class was recorded, or we tried to record it, but there were some technical difficulties. So we're going to be redoing that class so that we're in order. Uh, we're now on Hadith number 27. And Hadith number 27 actually contains two hadith. We are looking at the 40 hadith, and we mentioned earlier in the beginning of the class that it has more than 40 hadith. And this is one of the reasons. Um, number one, Imam al nawi ends with 41. And then number two, some of the entries actually contain two hadith grouped as one. And this hadith, or these two hadith, are touching on the same topic, uh, and that's why Imam al nawi put them together and grouped them both under one single number. And inshallah, we'll read the hadith in Arabic and then look at the meaning. Imam al nawi says, عَنَ النَّوَاسِ بِنِ سَمْعَانَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ عَنْهُمَا عَنَ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ قَالْ أَلْبِرُّ حُسْنُ الْخُلُقْ وَالْإِثْمُ مَا حَاكَ فِي نَفْسِكَ وَكَرِهْتَ أَنْ يَطَلِعَ عَلَيْهِ النَّاسِ رواه مسلم وعن وابصاء بن معبد رضي الله عنه قال أتيت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال جئت تسأل عن البر قلت نعم قال استفتي قلبك البر ما أطمأنت إليه النفس وطمأن إليه القلب وَالْإِثْمُ مَا حَاكَ فِي النَّفْسِ وَتَرَدَّدَ فِي فِي الصَّدَرِ وَإِنْ أَفْتَاكَ النَّاسُ وَأَفْتَوْكَ حَدِيثٌ حَسَنٌ رَوَيْنَاهُ فِي مُسْنَدَيْ الْإِمَامَيْنِ أَحْمَدُ بْنِ حَنْبَلٍ وَالدَّارِمِي بِإِسْنَادٍ حَسَنٍ الحمد لله this is hadith 27 and the first narration of the two comes from a companion by the name of uh, Nawas ibn Sam'an radiyallahu anhu. And he reported that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-birru husnul khuluq. Righteousness is good character. And sin is what scratches at your heart and with you, which you would not want people to know about. The second narration is coming from the companion Wabisa ibn Ma'bad radiallahu anhu. And he says that he came, he says, I came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said to me, you have come to ask about righteousness, bir. Yes, I answered. He said, istafti qalbak, seek Fatwa from your heart, or we could translate it as consult your heart. Albir, righteousness, is that concerning which the soul feels tranquility and the heart feels tranquility. And sin is that which scratches at the soul or creates restlessness within the soul and moves to and fro, creating restlessness within the breast, the sadr. Even though people may give you their verdicts in favor of that thing. This, Imam al nawi says, is a hasan hadith, a sound hadith, transmitted in the, the two musnads of Al Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal and Imam al darimi rahmatullahi alayhim. So, as we mentioned, these are two hadith grouped together because they are touching on the same theme, and that is the theme of righteousness and good character, and the theme of identifying sin through the feelings they evoke in the healthy heart of a believer. 
So these two companions, the first one is an Nawas ibn Sam'an radiallahu anhuma, And he was a companion who met the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a delegation with his father. Uh, we've talked many times about these delegations who were chiefs of various tribes in Arabia who would go, they would usually embrace Islam after receiving a companion of the Prophet sallallahu who would travel out to them and spread the message of Islam. When the people would embrace Islam there, the chiefs of the tribe and the dignitaries, the, the shurafa of the people, would often travel from those distant lands to Medina to formally pledge their loyalty to the Prophet sallallahu And so Nawas ibn Sam'an went with his father who traveled to Medina to pledge his loyalty to the Prophet sallallahu and he ended up staying in Medina for a year and lived among the Ahlul Sufa, those who did not have homes, who lived instead inside the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu And he relates 17 hadith in total in the hadith corpus. The second companion is Wabisa ibn Ma'bad radiallahu an, And he visited the Prophet Sallallahu with a delegation as well in the ninth year after the Hijrah, and he relates 11 hadith. So the theme of this hadith, we mentioned, centers around three things. The meaning of righteousness, uh, being good character, and identifying what is sinful through what feelings sinful behavior evokes in the heart of a of a purified believer. So going to the first part of the hadith of Nawas ibn Sam'an, he relates that the Prophet Sallallahu said, Al-birru husnul khuluq, righteousness is good character. And this is not to say that righteousness is limited to good character, but it's similar to the other hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu speaks about the centrality of certain things. For instance, when he says, Al-Hajju Arafa, that Hajj is standing at Arafat, it's not that Hajj is only standing at Arafat, but Arafat is a central pillar of the Hajj, so much so that it's almost reducible to standing at Arafat, it's so central. Um, likewise, when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says "Adinun nasiha," that the deen is sincere counsel or sincerity, you know, it is encapsulated in that. So, bir as righteousness is encapsulated and expressed in good character. Now, the word bir is basically righteousness and goodness. And its basic meaning is to treat others well, to treat them in a wholesome and beautiful way. And that is why in uh, Islam we have the term birrul waridain, uh, which is roughly translated as righteousness and good conduct towards one's parents. And a more accurate translation would be filial piety. Filial piety is the classical English translation for birr waridain. So birr can be used in a, in a general way and it can be used in a specific way. The specific way would be birr waridain, for instance, and a general way would be the central acts of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well as uh, holding to the articles of faith, having conviction in the central tenets of Iman. And we see that in Surah Al-Baqarah, because in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah Ta'ala tells us what bir is and says that it is not limited to turning our faces to the east or to the west. And that verse came down in the context of the Qibla. We know that the original Qibla the prayer direction was towards Jerusalem and then it was changed to Mecca, to the Kaaba. And in that verse, Allah Ta'ala says that it is not from Bir 
that you turn yourselves, your faces to the east or the west, meaning it's not limited to the physical position you face in prayer. But true bir is in one who believes in Allah, believes in the last day, believes in the angels, the scriptures, and the prophets. So here he mentions the central tenets of faith. And then he says, true bir is uh, among the end who gives wealth in spite of their love for it to the relatives and orphans, the needy, the travelers, and those who ask for help. And they give money, uh, charity for the freeing of slaves and who establish the prayer and who gives the zakat and who fulfill their promises when they promise. Those who are also patient in times of poverty and hardship and during times of battle. Allah Ta'ala ends the verse by saying, they are the ones who were true and they are the ones who are righteous. So that's a very broad description of the qualities of bir. You could you see Islam, Iman, and Ihsan uh, in that, that ayah. You see the actions of the limbs, the beliefs, and the actions of the heart. All of these things encapsulated in that verse which defines bir as righteousness. Now here the Prophet وسلم, is saying that bir is good character. So all of the things mentioned in the verse uh, are definitely bir. And bir is also seen in good character. So when we talk about good character, we have to understand um, the meaning of, of khuluq, from which we get akhlaq, and the roots of it, and the definition of character. And this requires us to look into the early uh, ethical theory of the pre-modern scholars and how they looked at matters of ethics and character. So to do that, we want to look at a very basic overview of the ethical theory of Imam Abu Hamad al-Ghazali, rahmatullahi alayhi as he outlines it in his Ihya, Ulum al din and in other works. So the root letters of Khuluq are Kha, Lam, Qaf. From that we have Khalaqa, which means to create. Khalaqa, he created. So Khalq refers to the physical creation, the physicality. The physical form is the khalq of the person. And the khuluq refers to the character traits, the qualities of the person. And, and we talked about that when we were studying the Shema al Muhammadiyah of Imam al-Tirmidhi. I mean, we mentioned in the beginning how Imam al-Tirmidhi collected the narrations that spoke about both the khalq and the khuluq together, the, the physical qualities as well as the qualities of character. Now, in terms of the definition for akhlaq, we want to look at how Imam al-Ghazali defined it. He, in his Ihya Ulum al din in the chapter on disciplining the soul, he defines akhlaq, character, as a trait of character that is firmly established uh, a firmly established condition or state of the soul from which actions proceed easily without the need for thinking and forethought. He says it's a trait that is firmly established within the soul from which actions proceed easily without needing to, th to think uh, or contemplate about them. This is defining akhlaq as a state of the soul. And he's stating that this is the quality which gives rise to certain actions that, in, that themselves do not require forethought or thinking for them to come out. Now we commonly think of akhlaq in the behavior of people. If we see a person who is very generous in giving money, we would say this person is Karim. 
he has the quality of generosity. From his akhlaq is generosity. But it's not necessarily the case that a person who gives money is kareem. Likewise, a person may be kareem in their character even though they are not seen giving money. How, how does this work? Some may object to the definition of Imam al-Ghazali and say that it's a problem because it's relating character to a condition of the soul and not intangible behavior. But this is a faulty understanding because akhlaq, according to Imam al-Ghazali's definition, it's an inner disposition that makes some behavior spontaneous and effortless and some behaviors difficult. So looking at the example of generosity, a person who may be uh, generous in their character, they have generosity as an inborn characteristic. However, they fail to manifest it outwardly because they lack the means. Maybe they don't have enough money. Maybe they're lacking. Or they're not demonstrating generosity because there are certain obstacles that prevent it. Nevertheless, they have the quality of generosity in themselves. Because when they have the means to give, it comes forth spontaneously without forethought. They're naturally generous. And the flip side, we see a person may give money. They may appear generous, but they're not generous by nature because they have a hard time doing it. They have to force themselves to do it. They have to discipline themselves to do it. Or maybe they do it and they have other motives. Maybe they're seeking prestige. Maybe they're showing off. But when a person has a quality of character embedded deeply within them, then the fruit of that character will manifest when there are no obstacles. And it manifests without them requiring uh, thinking and forethought. It, it, it emerges spontaneously and naturally. And that's the difference between a single act of generosity that is tangible and a person really being qualified with the characteristic of generosity. And you can apply that to any other characteristic. A person can have a good quality, but there's something that prevents them from manifesting it. And a person may manifest a good quality, but it may not be sincere. It may not be something coming from deep within them, or there may be some other motive. All this is to say that if we reduce uh, akhlaq to the tangible manifestation, we may judge certain people with good character even though it's not an inborn characteristic. And we may look at people as lacking in certain characteristics even though they have them, but they don't have the means to manifest them. So this requires us to really look inward to see what do we have that's natural of good qualities that manifest without thinking and forethought, that emerge spontaneously, and what characteristics are we lacking? Likewise, it requires us to see what negative qualities are easy to emerge from us and what negative qualities are unlikely to emerge from us. And this requires us to look at the nature of the soul and the inborn qualities versus the qualities we have to develop. And uh, this is also discussed in great length by Imam al-Ghazali in his ethical theory. Imam al-Ghazali says that uh, the human being, the soul, the nafs of the human being, has various quwat, various faculties. And uh, these faculties are the inborn qualities from which these characteristics emerge. Everyone has these. And some have more of them than others. Some will be lacking and others will have too much of some. So let's look at these one by one and see how character, how qualities of character emerge from them. Imam al-Ghazali says that the first faculty is called al-quwwatu shahwaniya. Al-quwwatu shahwaniya literally is the, 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 the faculty of desire or the strength of desire that resides in the human being. 
This he defines as the faculty that provokes movement of the limbs and the organs in search of pleasure. When we talk about al quwwat al-shahwaniya, this uh, appetitive faculty, it usually refers to the twin appetites of food and sex. And this is why Imam al-Ghazali has an entire book in the Ihya called Kitabu Kasr al-Shahwatayn, the book on the breaking of the two desires. And that means the breaking of the desires, the excess desires of food and sex. Uh, these are two natural desires, and it is a part of the healthy human constitution to have uh, sexual desire and des- desire to eat. However, it can be taken to an excess. So this is the first one. The quota shahwaniya is that strength and faculty within us that provokes us to move in search of the fulfillment of our uh, carnal desires and our gastric desires, if you will. The desire for food and the desire for uh, intimate relations. The second faculty, according to Imam al-Ghazali, is the quwwat al-tafakkur. The quwwat al-tafakkur is the contemplative faculty. It is the strength of one's mind, the strength of the intellect. It is that faculty that enables us to use our intelligence to consider the outcome of things and the consequences of things. It is the faculty of the intellect and mind. And the third faculty is called Al-Quwwatu al which is translated as the irascible faculty. Literally, that is the faculty of anger. And that is the strength within the human being that uh, compels the limbs to move, to push away something harmful or destructive, whether it's real or imagined. These are our three main uh, faculties in the soul. There is the first one, the appetitive faculty that compels us to move ourselves in search of food and sex. There is the quwwat al-tafakkur, the the contemplative faculty or the intellect. And then there's the quwwat al-ghadabiyya, the faculty of anger or the irascible faculty, which pushes us to uh, repulse things that are harmful to us or destructive, whether they're real or imagined. Now, these, when they are in balance, will give rise to certain virtues. And in Imam al-Ghazali's ethical theory, he says that there's four cardinal virtues that are the synthesis of all other virtues. In other words, when you look at all of the various qualities of character, and there are dozens and dozens of qualities of character, you can reduce them to four cardinal virtues. If you were to list them out, one, two, three, four, they would be cardinal virtues, and under each would be a series of qualities that are variations of that central cardinal virtue. And he says that these cardinal virtues uh, arise when the faculties, the quwat, the three quwat are trained and directed towards the purpose for which Allah created them. This is very, uh, in in my opinion, uh, and this probably because of my own learning style, it it is very hard to uh, conceptualize this in a way that will stick uh, unless it's visualized and drawn out on a chart. So maybe just hearing it in a classroom setting like this makes it still very abstract. So if you were to diagram this, you would diagram by mentioning the, f- the three faculties first. The appetitive faculty, the contemplative faculty, and the irascible faculty. And then you would list separately these four cardinal virtues, and which are, arise when those faculties are trained and directed to their purpose. And so let's talk about these four cardinal virtues. Um, These virtues 
are the synthesis of all of the virtues we have in Islam. And one of the interesting things about this system is these four virtues are only virtues when they are in balance. When the three quwat are trained and used for their purpose, these four cardinal virtues arise. And if the three quwat are imbalanced, then there will be an imbalance in the four cardinal virtues. That imbalance can go to the side of excess or it can go to the side of negligence, what we call in Arabic ifrat and tafrit. And these four cardinal virtues are as follows. The first one is hikmah, wisdom. The second one is courage. The third one is temperance. And the, third, the fourth one is justice. These arise, again, when the quwat, the three faculties, are trained and used for the purpose for which Allah Ta'ala created them. The first one is wisdom. And we said that wisdom is the one of the cardinal virtues under which there are many other virtues. Uh, wisdom, according to Imam al-Ghazali, is the ability to distinguish right from wrong in every situation. The second one is courage, shaja'a. And courage is defined as the ability to control the instinct for self-preservation. We all, as human beings, have an instinct Allah gave us to preserve our lives. And courage is the ability to control that self-preservation instinct. And that control is to use it in the most appropriate manner, as we'll see. The third quality the third cardinal virtue is called Iffa. Iffa is temperance and it's defined as the ability to control the physical appetites. And the fourth cardinal virtue is Adl or justice. And justice is defined as the ability to use temperance, courage, and wisdom to keep to the middle path and to avoid the disequilibrium of excess or negligence. So, when the when we go back to the three faculties, what are the three faculties? Faculty number one is the uh, appetitive faculty, al quwwat al The second one is it is the contemplative faculty. And the third one is the irascible faculty. These three, when they are in balance, will give rise to the three cardinal virtues. Right? Because in these, th we, there's four, but the first three are the ones that, are, that need to be kept in balance. So when the when the the quwwat tafakkur for example is kept in balance and trained one will attain the virtue of hikmah when the contemplative faculty is refined and trained one will have hikmah when the quwwa ghadabiyah is trained and refined one is going to obtain shaja'a courage uh, and when the quwwa shahwaniya is trained and refined one will attain the virtue of ifa. And when the latter two, the irascible faculty, al quwwat al ghadabiyya is trained, and the quwwa shahwaniya is trained, one will have adl, will have justice, balance. So, what we see here is that if there is uh, negligence or if there is excess, any lacking in the faculties will give rise to negative qualities of character. And whenever those three are balanced, 
they will give rise to positive, beautiful qualities of character, good akhlaq. The negative qualities that will arise if those three faculties are un- unbalanced, imbalanced, will either be tending towards negligence or they'll be tending towards excess. So we want to look at three things. We want to look at what happens when a person's faculty, contemplative faculty, is in balance. What qualities arise? What beautiful characteristics arise when the contemplative faculty is in balance and trained? What beautiful qualities of character arise when the appetitive faculty, al quwwat al-shahwaniyyah, is in balance? Is in balance. And what good qualities of character arise when the irascible faculty, al quwwat al ghadabiyyah is trained and refined and in balance. Then we want to look at what negative qualities arise when the contemplative faculty is tending towards negligence and when the quwwa al-shahwaniyyah tends towards negligence and when the quwwa ghadabiyyah tends towards negligence and then finally we want to see what happens when the contemplative faculty tends towards excess when the appetitive faculty tends towards excess and when the irascible faculty tends towards excess. So we have three sets of three. It's really good to diagram all of this. So first of all, what happens if we have balance? Imam al-Ghazali says in the Ihya that it is from the equilibrium of these four principles, because we're adding justice, because justice doesn't have a negligence or an excess. It doesn't tend towards either of them. It's, it's there or it's not. Justice is when there's balance in those three. He says it's from the equilibrium of these four principles that all good traits of character proceed. Therefore, when the quwwat al-tafakkur, the, the, the intellective faculty, the faculty of contemplation is balanced, it gives forth discretion. We have the qualities of discretion, of tamyiz, of excellence, of understanding, of understanding the subtle implications of actions, of having force foresight and seeing the consequences of what we do and we have the intelligence to see the hidden defects of the soul that's when the contemplative faculty is in balance but if that's unbalanced it could be unbalanced going towards excess or unbalanced and going towards negligence when unbalanced and excess, Imam al-Ghazali says, you get the qualities of cunning, of deception, of, of, of fraudulent behavior, and slyness. So this is the person who uses their intelligence, their natural quality of intelligence for evil ends. So they become... You know the the archetypal, the archetypical um, master criminal mastermind, who's very sneaky, who's sitting in his uh, lair, the the evil bad guy in the movie, who is sitting on the chair petting his cat, planning for world destruction. He's using his intelligence for swindling, cunning, deception. He's not using it for its natural purpose. That's when the intelligence faculty is in the excess and used to an evil end. He, when it's uh, negligent, then they're lacking in wisdom. They lack foresight. They lack intelligence. They don't think about the consequences of their actions. They become uh, dull-minded and so simple that they're easily fooled by others. So moving along, that's the contemplative faculty. When it's in balance, 
and when it's tending towards excess or negligence. If you go to the second quality, the second cardinal virtue, it's shaja'a, courage. Imam al-Ghazali says that uh, courage, when it's healthy, it gives rise to nobility and endurance. It gives rise to uh, dignified and honorable behavior, and it gives rise to the ability to suppress rage, meaning the person is not going to fly off the handle and lose their temper. Why? Because they have, they're using the irascible faculty, the faculty of anger, for its purpose. So they control the anger and use it only in the appropriate situations. He says that when the irascible faculty is unbalanced, the same trait will give rise to recklessness, arrogance, conceit, pride, and quickness to anger. So we look at the, the faculty of anger. When it's balanced, it means that we have anger, but it's used for its purpose, the purpose for which it was created, and that is to defend ourselves, to defend our loved ones, to defend truth, to defend people, to use it to save lives, to save our own. It is to motivate ourselves, to be angry with ourselves if we fail, to then discipline ourselves, to, to get after it, to discipline our egos and do what we have to do. When that quality is in excess, the person will become reckless. They will, un, they will unnecessarily risk their life and limb to settle a score, whether it is getting a fight, in a fight with someone or doing something uh, foolish and risky, risky behavior. Uh, it gives rise to the qualities of arrogance and conceit. Uh, it gives rise to the quality of uh, short-temperedness. That's when the quwa ghadabiya is in excess. We don't call that courage anymore. And if it's negligent, it means the person's faculty of anger is lacking. And that's not a virtue. Because that means the person will have the quality of being a coward. Basically, shaja'a is in the middle. Cow, uh, uh, courage is in the middle. And the excess is called tahawur, recklessness. And the negligence is called uh, juban, right? Cowardice. The person will be a doormat. The person will be a coward. The person will let people walk all over them. The person will tolerate abusive behavior and will not do what they need to do to prevent harm. And Imam al-Ghazali says elsewhere that if the faculty of courage is not developed and one is lacking in it, they will never be able to discipline their egos. They will never be able to engage in the necessary spiritual discipline to be a good Muslim. Because if you reflect on your own qualities, you'll see that we all have good qualities and bad qualities. We have hidden defects. And if you lack in the healthy anger, you will not get angry with yourself for having those bad qualities, which will motivate you to discipline yourself to, re to remove them. A person will be satisfied with those qualities. They will lack the needed strength to do the work of purifying themselves. So this is very important stuff. So we looked at wisdom as a virtue, a cardinal virtue, the virtues that are in the orbit of wisdom, and the negative qualities that arise when there's excess or negligence. We looked at the same thing with regard to courage, the cardinal virtue of courage, the virtues that are in the orbit of courage, and the qualities that arise if a person is lacking in courage or they're going towards uh, ne negligence, or if there's excess in that quwa ghadabiya, that uh, irascible faculty. The, the last one is the 
uh, appetite of faculty, which we said is food and sex, essentially. And when a person has that in balance, they have the quality of ifa, of temperance. Temperance is a quality, Imam al Ghazali says, that gives rise to modesty and generosity and patience and tolerance. However, if the quality of, of the shahwaniya is in excess, the person becomes greedy. The, the person becomes vile in character because they are immoral in seeking to fulfill their carnal appetites. And if they are lacking in quwa shahwaniya, then they are basically not fulfilling their purpose because they lack the drive to survive. So it is only when these faculties, the appetite of faculty is in balance, the irascible faculty is in balance, and the contemplative faculty is in balance, that we have the cardinal virtues and all of the other virtues that orbit around them. And all of this together is what we call husnul khuluq, good character. Therefore, according to Imam Ghazali, all human traits are branches of wisdom, courage, temperance, and justice. And our life's work, our mujahada, our struggling as Muslims is to take the qualities we receive from the Prophet ﷺ and to inculcate them in our daily life, to work towards establishing them as our character qualities while recognizing that no one is able to have all of these cardinal virtues and these faculties in complete balance, in absolute balance, away from negligence and excess, except for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imam al-Ghazali says that there is no one but the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who has attained perfect balance in all of these qualities. Every single person, you, me, everyone else, though we may strive to attain balance, we're always going to have different degrees of proximity and distance from these cardinal virtues. So mujahada and tahdeeb al-akhlaq uh, and tazkiyah, all of these qualities of purification, of self-development, of discipline, uh, building character, refining character, all of these uh, ethical virtues in our tradition are about taking the qualities we learned and received from the Prophet wasallam and trying to build them within ourselves through companionship, through mutual reminders, through learning and practice so that we have ilm and amal and hal, so that you have knowledge of what these things are and that you practice them until they become a, a firmly embedded state in quality in the soul. And that leads us to a really important point that Imam al-Ghazali mentions in his ethical theory, that some of these qualities will be naturally inborn and easier to refine than others. Some people are naturally more generous than others. Some people are naturally braver than others. Some people are more intelligent than others. ذَلِكَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ يُؤْتِهِ مَنْ That's the bounty of Allah. He gives to whomever He wills. Which leads to the question, is it possible for a person to refine their character and to make the qualities they don't naturally have, qualities they take on and uh, have as their own? Some people have argued that it's a waste of time to inculcate these qualities of character that are not naturally within us. Because if we don't have them, we won't ever have them. They said that just as a person is born with certain physical features, they're born with certain uh, qualities of character. And just as you cannot change your physical features drastically, you can't drastically change your character. Imam al-Ghazali argues against that. He says that no, you can and must refine your character and you can take qualities you don't have, adopt them, and work with them until they become your own. He says that if 
it were not possible for us to refine our character, then there would be no purpose in Allah Ta'ala sending messengers. Because Allah Ta'ala has sent messengers to humanity, bringing them the message of La ilaha in Allah, and also calling them to refine character. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says in the hadith, إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ I have only been sent to refine the noble qualities of character. Notice that he doesn't say, إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ لِأُؤَسِّسَ مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ He doesn't say, I was sent to establish the noble qualities of character. He sent, I was, I was sent to complete them. Because the qualities of character were a part of the ethics called to by all of the prophets. And were it not possible for human beings to adopt those qualities, then there would be no purpose in Allah Ta'ala sending prophets to call people to adopt those qualities. Therefore, we can work with them. We can try to adopt them and work with our soul so that what is not our nature becomes our nature. And that underpins the entire ethical theory of Tazkiyya and Tahdeeb al-Akhlaq, refining the character of Mujahada. Everything in our tradition that speaks about developing the soul is uh, based on this understanding that we can refine our character if we put in the work. And that's another topic. So this hadith tells us that uh, bir, righteousness, is good character. It's not limited to praying five times a day or fasting in Ramadan. Righteousness is not limited to the outward rituals because the Prophet ﷺ has told us in, in other narrations uh, about 